And for those of you that are attending online, welcome to our community forum, March 15th, 2021, here at the middle school. We have an interesting, uh, I think we have an interesting time here for you tonight for some of the things you're going to see and hear from the administration. So sit back, enjoy, and we'll give you some good information. And uh, hopefully if there's any questions that come in, I'm not sure if there'll be a way for us to determine that, but... Uh, if anyone's here that would have questions at the end, we could we can take some questions and answers. So, uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Z and Ms. Flesher, and they can take away the presentation. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me get our our PowerPoint going here. Phyllis and I are going to do this a little differently this year. Normally, we have our our budget PowerPoint during this time, but we, we've added a little bit more information, and we're going to we're going to tag team this whole thing. So, as we get started, I want to just visit something that we had talked about earlier. Hey, Josh, how can I get rid of subtitles? Let's end the show and start over. All right. Got it. All right. Um, we conducted a snow day and a virtual day survey with our parents, teachers, and students. Uh, we got over 1,500 responses, which was, was awesome. At the faculty, students, it was only middle school and high school. And then parents, they run the gamut. They have some all elementary, some elementary middle, some have all three levels. So it's broken down between all of them. Uh, what I found interesting, and it kind of jumps out at us, is the elementary were, were fairly split between a snow day and a virtual. In virtual days. Not surprising. Okay. It is a uh, about 50-50 for the students. Overall, it was a 60-40 split, 60%. is some of the reasons for the snow day versus the virtual day. People were having trouble accessing the internet. They were having trouble with the information that was being presented. So when we look at this going into the future, we're looking at snow days being snow days. But once we run out of snow days, we are going to be using virtual days moving forward after that. We have built-in snow days in the calendar. Um, we can revisit this conversation next year. Because knock on wood, no more snow days for 2021. Also, want to take a quick look at our COVID numbers for those of you that have been following online. If you go to our website, uh, there's a big COVID banner there. You just click on it, and it will immediately take you to this chart. And we're using Fridays because we had a not there. It immediately takes you to this chart. I'm using Friday's numbers because we had a hard reset this weekend. So the number of active cases at the end, when you look at today's, these are all going to be zero. 
what you've noticed if you've been following this chart at all is we've had dramatic decreases in the number of cases across all levels. There was times when we would have anywhere up to 30 plus for day seven and into the 40s for 14 days. Now, what we added about three, four weeks ago was the number of cases to consider when shifting. Just because we have cases at the high school, there was 10 within the last 14 days, they may have occurred during a last hard shift or their quarantine time is up and these students are actually back in school. You have to remember that it's now a 10 day uh, quarantine time that students can go back after 10 days, not 14 days. PDE has just not changed the, the 14 day window to reflect their, their own update from going from 14 to 10. So you're gonna see some different numbers. Um, we do report these to the Department of Health, all cases, and Lancaster General and Penn Medicine. Penn Medicine LGH is going to be our proxy county health organization. Right now it's still in the legal maneuvering between Department of Health and Penn Medicine LGH. But as soon as the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted, we'll officially be reporting to Penn Medicine LGH and also notifying the Department of Health. Nope. Josh, can we get a microphone on Phyllis, please? Nope. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, as Dr. Z said, um, a couple of slides about the economic impact of COVID. Um, we had talked about next two slides at a previous board meeting, um, but in this forum, just wanted to recap uh, what the impact of COVID looks like um, on the Pennsylvania economy and how that then trickles down and impacts Conestoga Valley. And as you've heard me say before, Conestoga Valley has uh, a less reliance on our residential uh, tax base than we do on the, than some of the other districts um, in Lancaster County. We just tend to be a little bit more weighted towards the industrial commercial side, um, which can be good and bad, it's sort of a double-edged sword. Uh, so if you take a look at this chart and see the impact of COVID, and you just need to look at the percent column the whole way over on the right-hand side, and you can see full-service restaurants um, have been hit hard, uh, as well as retail clothing and accommodations. And certainly, um, when you think about the Conestoga Valley community and the businesses that are here, uh, those three are prevalent um, in our community. So um, we're certainly going to see the impact of that um, on our tax base. In, in those three sectors. Uh, the next slide then uh, just gives you a, a nice graph in fiscal office uh, of what a recovery would look like. So the thing I like about this chart is that it goes back and grabs some of the prior recessions and, and takes a look at the impact of those. And then you can see how much more dramatic the COVID impact was. Uh, if you follow the number of years across the bottom of the chart, you can see that it takes about two years uh, for us on the COVID trajectory to get kind of back to the same low point that we hit after the uh, 2008 crisis. And then if you follow the chart the whole way uh, to the right, you're going to see it really takes five or six years until uh, in the forecast of COVID, so we're going to be able to crawl back out uh, and just get back to zero. Um, and what that means for us is, and you'll hear this theme not only tonight, but as we continue to work through the budget in the next couple of months, there's going to be a lot of long-term planning. We're going to be looking at, at things over our multi-years. Uh, we typically do uh, our budget uh, on a five-year projection anyway, uh, so that the board doesn't, and the administration as well, doesn't just look at a point in time, but we're sort of looking forward. Uh, that's even going to be more important um, as, we, as we go forward. So the next slide is just a recap for those in the community of what the final preliminary budget that the board approved in February looks like. Um, obviously, uh, we still have a, a deficit. Um, we 
couple of months kind of whittling away. Um, February is a big, administratively a big budget meeting month for us, so we're through that now. Um, and we'll be able to come back to the board shortly um, with some numbers that look a little bit different than these, but with the timeline uh, that we need to follow, which is also um, prescribed in state code, um, we, we just needed to be able to, to get something in front of everybody, um, and it gives us a starting place. Uh, so certainly, a couple of areas there you can see where we have escrow funds, which are our fund balance numbers, so we will be utilizing some fund balance, so even uh, when we get the budget to the end, um, the um, by using those reserve funds. And then you can see um, a breakout of the Act 1 index, which is 3%, and then uh, the possible exception that we had agreed to apply for. We, we may not use it, but at least we have that option. Um, and so certainly, if we chose not to use either one of those, uh, not to use the exception, or not to put an Act 1 tax increase in place, that would take our just under $3 million deficit and make it about a $4.5 million deficit. So one of the things we traditionally do at this meeting um, is just take a, a peek at what the expenses and the revenues look like. And so I'm going to do um, just a couple of slides on expenses and then turn it uh, back over to Dr. Z. Uh, we'll hit the revenues a, a little bit later. Um, for those of you who are more number people and less uh, pretty dollar sign chart kind of of this presentation, uh, you will actually see a breakout of the numbers that go behind both this chart and the revenue chart. So they are there. Um, just for brevity, we're not going to go through you know, individual line items. We thought we'd show it to you uh, in this format. So where do our dollars go? And no surprise that uh, we're a service industry. So you can see that a large portion, about two thirds of our dollars, go into salaries and benefits. You're not going to see much of a change if you look back um, a number of years and what the percent, if you take those two numbers and add them together, look like. But what you will see is that while the percent of salaries is a little bit less, the percent allocation of benefits keeps going up, and I'll, I'll talk about that um, just in a minute. Um, the other two areas that we're going to talk about, dive into a little bit more deeply tonight, is that 18%, which is uh, purchase services, and then we're also going to just touch on debt service, uh, which is the 8% number. So as I mentioned, um, the next slide talks about a couple of these, so I'll do the first three and then turn it back over to Dr. Z. Uh, so special education is a big ticket item for us. We have had some years um, where special education has grown more than others, um, but we, we tend to have, it tends to be a, a growth year over year each year. Uh, the reason I mentioned that purchase services, that 18% between purchase and professional services, is one of the things that drives uh, that number is contracts that we have both with the intermediate unit but also with other districts. Either we have enough kids, we have a big enough cohort, or we have the expertise to be able to do it to bring those kids back. Uh, so that's one thing that we're going to be looking at um, for the 21-22 budget year. There are some places where we can, can have a win-win and uh, bring some students back in some particular areas. Um, our first goal, obviously, is always uh, the focus is on the student. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're bringing students back and getting them in their home building so that the kids they're going to school with are the same kids that are in their neighborhood um, and their other activities that they socialize with. And then the secondary component is obviously if we can do it and at a cheaper cost, then again, that's that win-win piece. The second item that I had talked about, um, or that was on the other slide, uh, the two reasons that benefit number keeps going up. One is retirement, and we've talked about that one in the past. Don't misunderstand by me not mentioning tonight to think it's gone away or has become a problem. Um, it has leveled out. It's just, it's such a big number at this point that it sort of is where it is. 
Um, but healthcare is one that we are keeping an eye on right now. Unfortunately, and some districts are just in different positions. Um, Post-COVID, uh, you had some um, districts where they were seeing actually healthcare costs decline uh, because there were uh, you know, appointments and procedures that were canceled or people just didn't want to go to the doctor. Um, and then you had others that were relatively flat. And now what's happening this year, um, after we've sort of been through that, that valley of, uh, of COVID, is that some districts are kind of seeing a flattening out and other districts are experiencing an increase. Um, in our case, some of the increase may very well be pent up demand, uh, but in our case, that increase is actually related to specialty drugs. So if you think back to this community forum uh, two years ago in 2019, uh, that was something that we talked about then. We knew it was coming, we've been watching it. Um, and the one thing that, that COVID has actually benefited is that uh, we will be able to put a program in place that will allow us to do some alternate things um, to get the specialty drugs into the hands of folks who need them um, through a telemedicine component. So we'll be looking at that as well. And then finally, I mentioned I was gonna talk about debt service before I turn it back over to, to Dr. Z. Um, certainly, you know, if you've um, been at our board meetings, um, we had uh, construction at Brownstown. Um, we now have the, uh, the middle school underway. And what comes on the back end of that is refurbishing this building, uh, the existing middle school, um, as well as Leola Elementary. And um, so, you know, that's one of those components when you look at those percentages and see, you know, kind of what is great. Um, you can see that debt service number um, is, a, is a significant part of our expense budget. Um, and it's because we're in a great position because we sort of had debt roll off and we were able to layer the new piece in, but it still um, is a sizable portion of our budget. So Dr. Z, I think it's back to you for charter schools. Cyber, cyber schools was the last one that was mentioned there, and just some facts, no matter what it says on radio, television, in the giant center around the big ring, they're not free. They are funded by you, the local taxpayer. Their academic performance ranks in the bottom percentile when compared to public schools, and you can go to the futurereadypa.org website to see that. And the cost per student varies between regular education students and special education students. And also, if we have the same identified student in two different districts, the cyber charter school charges two different rates. So there is no standard rate for cyber charters. And they are managed by for-profit companies. So it is not a a, a free education for anybody. The impact schools, and we listed the Lancaster County districts here for the last two years. You'll see that uh, we've increased 71% this year. Partially it is due to COVID, so some of our numbers have gone up, but that's a half million dollar increase that we've had. The regular education charter tuition is 11.5 for us, and cyber charter for special ed is 26.2. It's 26.2 for any special ed student, no matter what their identified disability is. So if it does not cost that much money to educate a student with that certain disability, it's going in their pockets. You see that we had 415 CVVA students this year for a total of $1.2 million. We had 85 cyber charter for 1.2 million. We educated almost five times as many, and their cost was almost, was more than four times as much as ours. That's a lot of people, that's a lot of money. It's money that we can be saving, it's money that's coming out of your, out of your pockets. And I'll address in, at the end, on the backside, what we can do for this. There are cyber charter laws that are in effect by the legislature right now. We need to get those fixed. We've been hearing for years that they are gonna take a look at them. They're gonna talk about accountability on the academic side, but no one as of yet is looking at accountability on a financial side. And that's gotta change. We have to get with our legislators and have them be the impetus to make a difference for our students. 
All right, Phyllis, I think I'm going to turn it back to you now for the next couple. Yep, I'm going to talk about uh, revenues. I'll handle uh, the federal piece, and then I'll turn it back to Dr. Z to talk about some of the state pieces. Uh, so uh, this chart also, um, this graphic, it doesn't look a lot different over the years. Um, you really need the numbers to move significantly uh, to, to make these percentages move. Uh, so if you would add our state and federal together, that 22% has been very, very, very consistent. Um, what's going to be interesting is if you've been following um, what's been going on in Washington, there was uh, right around the holidays um, what they call ESSER II, which was a, uh, a package um, that's going to send money out to schools to be used between now and uh, September of 2023. And then just recently um, at the federal level, the ESSER III um, relief package uh, was put in place, which is also going to generate about twice the amount of money as the, uh, the holiday package um, in uh, revenue out to the, to the school. So the federal, or the, excuse me, the revenue piece is a little bit easier in that there aren't as many moving parts, but more challenging in that we can control the expenses a little bit easier than we can control the revenue that's, that's coming in. Um, we have some more limitations on this side. Uh, so uh, one of the things that's important to note um, is that there is a portion of these funds uh, that do need to be used uh, for remediation, So that if, and we are working on that internally. Um, we are now going to be starting this month in March uh, to start to pull those numbers together and figure out uh, what our students need. Um, when you look statewide, you'll see very different pictures. So for those districts who have not been in school, um, they still need to purchase a lot of masks and PPE and decals and things that we've already had to do and been doing. Uh, we will continue to do that um, as the pandemic ensues, and um, hopefully it'll be less of that next year, but there may be some residual of, of those things that need to be purchased. Um, but then focusing on that remediation piece, and then the piece that comes after that is, is really sort of where it gets tough in that this is one-time money, so we can't just say, oh, I had that you know, $4.5 million deficit, I'm just going to plug this $4.4 million and I'm going to be done, because um, all that does is kick the can down the road. It creates a hole in the, in the budget where I don't have recurring revenues that are going to be there to support that $4.4 million deficit once the federal funds are gone. So I can do that for a couple of years, but um, then I really get, get stuck um, in between a rock and a hard place trying to make it happen going forward. And as we just showed you, even if we would do a tax increase, tax increases generate about a million and a half. So I can't possibly even do enough of a tax increase to, to cover that hole. So what we're looking to, to do is look at uh, short-term expenses, but we also want short-term expenses spent wisely. So we're going to be looking at things um, that have a long-term impact. So it could be things that we were going to buy anyway that are going to free up some funds somewhere else in the budget, uh, maybe to do some, some other things that we need uh, to, that need to be done. Or it could be projects that we sort of already had on back burner that we can bring forward and make sure that we get them done. Uh, one of the other things that uh, in the appendix of this presentation, and again, we're not going to cover it tonight. I think. Did I lose you? Yep, we lost you. We lost Phyllis. Am I back? There, I'm back with that. Uh, we're not going to cover tonight. Is there are two slides in the back of the presentation that list out all the different um, parameters that that money can be used for. So we can't just say, oh, we're going to use it for salaries because that's not one of the allowable expenses. Uh, so you can take a look at that at your leisure and certainly let us know if you have any questions. Uh, so we'll be trying to plan then over the next couple of years, uh, kind of a longer term plan. Again, I mentioned that five-year projection um, before uh, to try to make sure uh, that we aren't stuck in a position at some point down the road. Dr. Z, I think it's back to you for the, uh, the state piece and the fair funding formula. Yep. The, with the state, you may want to know, how does the state give us our money? And they developed a fair funding formula. Um, the fair funding formula went into effect, but it's only for new money. So they're not putting all the money that the state has that's going out to districts. It's not all running through that formula. They said that we're going to keep running all the money through it, but only the new money gets to go through the fair funding formula. So you'll see in a paper where we were getting a $400,000 increase in state funding. And everybody's like, wow, that's awesome. Well, the thing is, 
The state owes us, if we ran everything through, we would get a $10 million increase. But they're only running a small portion through, so it's only a $400,000 increase. So what the state has decided to do is do it very, 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 very slowly to get the money through the formula. This causes a problem. They don't want to, they want to hold everybody harmless. It's a hold harmless is a phrase. They don't want the people that are getting overpaid to lose that money too quickly. They're worried about the people who are overpaid and not the people who are underpaid. We've been held harmless the entire time that we started doing the fair funding formula. So we're not asking for all of it right away, but we would like that, that formula to be implemented sooner than the state is currently doing it. For 2021, as I just mentioned, we get about $4.7 million from the state, and we got the new money of 476000 If they ran all the money through it, it was a $10 million. So right there, because the state isn't doing their fair share, the locals have to pick up the slack. So the impact on, on us as taxpayers, um, cyber charter costs, there was a bill that never made it out of, out of committee that said that if a district has a viable virtual option, that th that district does not have to pay for a PA cyber charter tuition. That would be a parent choice. If we're offering similar, the parent wants something else and the parent would pay for something else. We have a similar, actually a better, higher performing program in district. So that would save $1.245 million. And Phyllis, I believe you said 1.5 is a tax increase. We fix that, we fix our, our tax increase. The fair funding formula is another problem. If we would get more of our fair funding, not all of it, but more, again, the impact to the taxpayer will be huge. Sometimes you hear that we're compared with other districts and other districts are saying, well, we're not going above the index where CV is considering going above the index at, from time to time. Our index is 3.0. If you go to Donegal, their index is 3.9%. Even with our exception added on to our index, we would never hit their adjusted base index. So be careful when you start or start hearing districts being compared to other districts. It is truly not an apples to apples comparison. It's more of an apples to oranges. So right now, the, uh, the cost to the homeowner with the average um, Assessed house being 213000 with a 3% base index increase, it would be an increase of $91 in your tax bill, and plus the exception, it would be 105 This doesn't include the homestead exceptions. So we are doing everything we can to lower our expenses. That's our job. And we will continue to do that through the final budget. The budget that was shown is only a preliminary budget. That is not the final budget we will get that number down lower. But what you can do in the meantime, I listed the addresses and the phone numbers of our local congressmen. Please give them a call or write them a letter. We're doing that at a district level. Superintendents are doing it. We're meeting with, us, with the uh, congressmen, with the senators. Please, though, when they hear the public is when they really start moving. So we need everybody's help help get our fair funding to help cyber charter school costs be fixed and then we can help we can help you not have to pay so many taxes all right um, as Phil said after the questions there are some appendices so when this is posted to the board doc you'll be able to access them there's uh, about four or five pages of appendices that have all the details that are in there but any questions from anyone that is here tonight? Mr. President, uh, hearing on, we're ready for the board meeting then, sir.
Lord just give you kind of a nod when we're ready? <laughs> All right. I'd like to call to order the March 15th uh, school board meeting of Conestoga Valley School District. Notice that all are in attendance. Uh, if you could please join me with the pledge to the flag. Which is over here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Well, welcome everyone that's here tonight and any of those watching online, welcome. Uh, board, I need a motion to approve our agenda tonight. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, we have an agenda. Board commendations for the month of March 2021. The Paradise Rotary Club announced its Student of the Month for March 2021, and CV High School junior Chris Needham was one of three students honored. Congratulations, Chris. Congratulations to Middle School Students of the Month for the month of February. The seventh grade students of the month were Riley Ripchinski, Damian Long, Beatrice Hollister, and the eighth grade students of the month were Kara Harris, Genesis, Genesis Cuyate Moreno, and Michael Brady. Congratulations to high school senior Bella Saviglio, who was selected as the 2020 recipient of the Linda Shelley Spirit Award by the Lancaster Lebanon League. The Linda Shelley Spirit Award, named in honor of a field hockey official, Linda Shelley, who passed away in 2011, is given to the Lancaster Lebanon field hockey athlete who best exemplifies the character, spirit, and essence of what Linda demonstrated throughout her life. Congratulations to high school senior swimmer Micah Lehman as he took home ninth place in the District 3 swim meet on the weekend of March 6th. Micah swam a career best time of uh, four minutes and 50 seconds in the, in the 500 freestyle to finish ninth overall in the event. A special thank you to Dr. Brian Barnhart, Executive Director of the IU-13, and Mr. Flip Steinauer, Assistant Executive Director of the IU-13, for their tireless work in getting vaccinations into the arms of our employees. They formed a partnership with Sloan Pharmacy to address Group 1A eligible educators and most recently coordinating, coordinated the ongoing distribution of the single dose Johnson & Johnson vaccines to CV, SOSL, and Brightbill employees. Thanks, Brian and Flip, for helping keep us safe. Those are our commendations for March. Uh, Dr. Z, any comments from you? Yes, Mr. President. Today, the governor came out with some updates on easing the limits of indoor and outdoor establishments. Restaurants are 50% capacity, and if self-certified, they can use 75%. However, the requirements such as mask wearing and social distancing, including six feet between diners, also apply. Maximum occupancy limits for indoor events to allow for 25% of maximum occupancy, regardless of the venue size. And for outdoor events, 50% of maximum occupancy. However, maximum occupancy is permitted only if attendees and workers are able to comply with the six foot physical distancing requirement. So while this sounds great, we still have to stay distance when we have places like the uh, stadium and indoors in the, in the gymnasiums. However, this brings us to our an ongoing discussion regarding prom and graduation. 
Dr. Smith has had preliminary discussions with his class advisors, graduation advisors, and admin team, and will soon be meeting with his student leaders. Currently, with regard to prom, it's to be held at the Eden, and with the governor's newest guidelines of 50%, the Eden can accommodate 250 guests. We normally have approximately 450 students attend, juniors and seniors and guests. So even if it was seniors only and we cut that in half, it would be 225. Some of the concerns though, social distancing with dinner and dancing. Ability to contact trace, which would be nearly impossible. So everyone going would, near, would almost have to be contact traced if someone tested positive. However, some options moving forward include keeping the planned date, splitting the prom into two days, or considering outside venues. A number of districts have already canceled the, the, uh, their prom, but we have not decided to do that. We are still trying to look for an answer. With regard to graduation, it is still on June 4th. And again, we are considering all options. And some of these options include, but they're not limited to, uh, Calvary Church, which is now 25% maximum capacity, but we have to maintain a six foot distance and the stadium, which is now at 50% capacity, but again, maintaining six feet social distancing. We're also looking at the drive-through option or a modification of the drive-through option that we used last year. Again, I just wanted to let everyone know that Dr. Smith and his team are investigating every possible opportunity for our students to enjoy prom and graduation this year. That's it, Mr. President. All right, uh, any correspondence from the secretary? did receive a letter from an area businessman, Michael Martin. He had uh, children graduate from Conestoga Valley and has uh, grandchildren in the district as well. He wrote a letter to the school board um, and he just wanted to affirm your decision to open schools and have the children in schools all year long. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Yeah, I also wanted to note it's attached for your review. Okay, I was just gonna say that's attached for everybody to see, correct? Uh, any comments from the board tonight? All right. I think we have our student representative. Uh, is Ellie here? Mm -hmm. And Ellie, when you talk into the microphone, just make sure you talk into the microphone. Mm -hmm. That way everybody can hear you. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, so my name is Ellie Livingston, and I'm here to present because I am the president of our high school's student council. So you can go to the first side, Dr. Z. Okay, so the first thing I want to highlight is something that I'm personally extremely excited for, and that is our spring musical, which is one of my favorite movies, Grease. And uh, I have a lot of very talented friends that are performing in the show and they are rehearsing tirelessly because they have five shows this year, which is more than they've ever done. Um, and that's because they're both indoor and outdoor. Uh, they wanna make sure that they can accommodate as many people and different COVID restrictions, especially with having uh, their last two shows being in person canceled. So they're trying to come up with as many options as possible to make sure nothing can come in the way of them performing this amazing show. So the dates are there. It is April 7th through 11th. And they're trying to accommodate as many people. So they're using different singing masks to be as COVID safe as possible. And they're also working really hard to build an outdoor stage and have a whole outdoor plan so that can run smoothly as well. And then this slide and actually the next slide are highlighting the sports that have started last week. So today was the first day of the second week of spring sport practice. Um, I am on the girls lacrosse team and I know I'm really excited to be starting, especially that we're starting on time because um, the last winter and fall seasons were started off of schedule. So I'm really grateful that we're starting on time. And here I have the First contests for the girls sports, and then the next slide uh, has the first contests for the boys. And I know even with having to wear masks and um, different COVID restrictions, I know that everyone's just very thankful 
and feeling blessed that we're able to be playing our sports because last year obviously didn't work out for spring sports. So that's really exciting. And as the president of student council, I'm really excited to be sharing that we are coming up with a solution for our talent show. It's definitely more smaller scale, um, but we wanted to give, especially the seniors this year, um, the opportunity to showcase their talents to the school, especially after having such a successful show last year. We had probably the best show that we've ever had. Um, so we have a really short audition process and then um, we came up with videos uh, that are going to be showed on the high school CB Today announcements and also on student council social media. So right now we have six acts and they're all some sort of musical act, but they're all really interesting and different in their own way. Uh, we're not exactly sure when those are coming out yet, um, but somewhere end of March, beginning of April, and we're just trying to figure out all of the editing details. So the student council Instagram handle is there, and then also WCVH on YouTube will have those videos eventually. And then lastly, um, I'm also a member of National Honor Society, so right now uh, we're the focus of March and the focus of April is to raise money for the May Minithon event. Um, right now we're planning to have it outside or inside, depending on the COVID restrictions at the time in May. Um, it's looking like it'll be outside, but there's a lot of fun things that we can do outside, like having games on the turf or having different rented activities and food trucks. So the QR code on the bottom of the screen is actually a direct link to the uh, Four Diamonds donor drive that is linked to our high school's mini-thon. So we're trying to get as many people signed up for the donor drive as possible. So any donations would be really appreciated. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Billy. Thanks, Ellie. <laughs> All right, we have a student report from Smoketown. Dr. Brenneman, do you want to say anything before? Well, thank you for having us. Um, I know that our students have worked hard to prepare for the activities that we did in the fall, but also for presenting this evening. Um, we have, unfortunately, many students who have experienced some type of significant loss in their life, um, either a parent, a sibling, grandparent, guardian, and in my time at Smoketown, we've had at least 35. Um, so that has been something that we know as adults that children and adults bring what happens in life to school with them, and that if we don't address that, that it's hard for them to then be able to focus and move on with what we need them to do at school. So we take that very seriously, and we do a lot of um, things in school to support them with that, um, running groups and you know providing all extra supports for them as well as for their family. And with the way school ended last year and you know students coming back this year, we knew that there would also be some additional types of grief that students are experiencing. And so this year with our, um, in the fall, there's a day that's called Children's Grief Awareness Day. And so it was focused on particular grief and loss, but also broadening that to include other types of losses that you still go through the grieving process. And um, Mrs. Sharp, our school counselor, planned activities for that entire week, and the students also um, really took ownership and leadership of that. So I'm gonna turn it over to her and the students, and they will share with you what we did that week. All right, um, thank you very much for having us um, and just inviting us this evening. Uh, Ava and I actually were talking the other day that when we began planning these activities, we had no, many, no idea how many hearts it would touch, and we're just thankful to be able to share with you everything these amazing students have done. Um, the sad news is that these four children and four of their um, peers uh, took part in an activity because they lost a close family member. Um, as Dr. Brenneman said, we had 35, over 35, I'm here one extra year longer than her, so I had 37, but 37 of our students since I've been here have come through Smoketown, either have lost a parent, sibling, or caregiver in their household, um, or had experienced that loss before they came to school, and we're obviously grieving that. Um, Dr. Brenneman just handed out folders that we created for you because while we want to give you a, a little glimpse of what took place on Children's Grief Awareness Day, we can't possibly 
capture all the images. And so we did share some things in that folder for you to look over tonight or whenever you have the opportunity. Um, it just, these students are amazing. And I have had such a privilege to be able to work with them for many years. Um, four of them were, were, are not able to join us this evening, but the eight children we chose were from fourth, fifth, and sixth grade who have just been through grief groups. Um, we even started a parent-child grief group two weeks before COVID hit, um, so we got cut short on that. Um, but as Dr. Brenneman said, with the pandemic and all the grief and loss, so many people, all of us are feeling, we felt like instead of doing grief groups this year, which would be limited due to the COVID restrictions, we would take the opportunity to empower these students and help them educate our Smoketown community. Um, I did have an intern with me, Mr. Michael Rouse, who is now interning at the high school. He couldn't be here this evening, but he also was a great assistance to this process as well. So first, I'm gonna ask the students to introduce themselves. They'll just tell you their name and just a little bit about how they became involved in the group, who they lost. So hello, my name is Ava. I'm 12 years old, I'm in the sixth grade, and I lost my dad in 2012. Hi, my name is Kaylee, and um, I'm in fifth grade, and my dad passed away in 2016. Hi, my name is Isabella Rivera, and I'm in fifth grade. I'm 10, and I lost my mom in 2016. Hi, my name is David Whitmer. I lost my brother in 2017, and I'm in fifth grade. Thank you, guys. Um, and as you can see, they have really <laughs> gained a lot of confidence and, and just uh, expression through their grief. Um, so I'm just going to ask them a few questions. Am I allowed to take this off? Perfect. I'm going to do something wrong, I can tell. All right, this will be easier. Um, I'm going to ask them a few questions so they can kind of share what they did with the program. So Ava, do you want to start us off and just tell us about the planning? We kind of learned about Children's Grief Awareness Day in October, and it was November 19th that we had to get ready for. So um, originally during this planning process, we did a lot of things to help spread awareness. One of the things we did was um, we made a flyer um, just letting everybody know what's going on and um, about Grief Awareness Day. Um, we also did window paint all around the school and on the windows, just so that way everybody could see the different messages um, and everything. And we also did um, blue butterflies as a symbol of hope, so everybody in the school did one, and we were all able to participate in that. Thank you. And as part of that planning, I'm going to have Keely explain a bit about her beautiful dress here because it symbolizes quite a bit about Children's Grief Awareness Day. Um, my dress re represents <laughs> most of it because it's blue and has butterflies on it because blue is the color of Children's Grief Awareness and the butterfly is the symbol of hope. And do you want to elaborate a little bit on the butterflies? Ava touched on that, but what did people do with the butterflies? Um, so staff and students all got a blue butterfly that they can either write down a person that they love, that they trust, or that passed away. And if they had no one to write down, they can write down a motivational sentence or something to just make someone smile. Yes, and we hung those throughout the school. You'll see those pictures in your folder. It was quite a powerful visual throughout the school. Some of our teachers reflected that it looked like a, a butterfly, a botanical garden. It was really neat. Um, we also noticed the beautiful butterfly in the hallway that is done by middle school students, and we took everybody's picture because it was just the perfect symbol of our evening here. Um, Izzy, will you share? Just answer the question. I'm not going to ask you. Will you share a little bit about the book? And I actually brought a copy if you want to hold it there, um, and what we did with this book and why it's important to you. So this book is really important to me because when, in 2016, when my mom passed away, um, the school counselor there uh, gave me this book and he wrote a message inside saying that my invisible string will be connected to my no mom no matter what, no matter where I am. The neat thing about this book, I don't know if you had a chance to see the video ahead of time. If you haven't, I hope you'll take a minute to watch this evening or another time. But we read this book on a video, and Izzy wasn't with us when we first started our planning. And the group unanimously voted on this book before she even knew about it. So when she heard we were reading it, she was so excited, and she took part in reading that story um, on the video. 
for the kindergarten through second graders, Mr. Rouse and I went to every kindergarten through second grade class and did a lesson with the invisible string so it was developmentally appropriate. And then the kindergarten through second grade children could develop to decorate their butterfly based on someone they love. Um, some of them felt that message because they had someone in heaven and so they talked about that and some of them just said they wanted to write about their mom who was home and that was fine. So all the butterflies are decorated differently and you'll see that in the samples we included in the folder. David, would you mind sharing a bit about the fundraiser we did and the organization we gave the money to? So we did an organization for Pathways and Hospice, which is a um, group that helps people when they lose somebody, help them talk about it and help them feel like they're not alone because they're not. And we did a fundraiser that was for them because they give Miss um, Sharp resources to help us and we wanted to give back to them to say thank you. And we raised $813.21 to give back to them. Do you want to share how we convinced the teachers and the students to donate? <laughs> <laughs> um, we convinced them to donate because on Friday the staff is allowed to wear jeans and if they wore jeans they had to donate and the students were allowed to put money in the coin jars in the cafeteria. Yeah, we could never have envisioned how much we'd raised for them, and that was really special. We actually did a presentation with them through Zoom and surprised them with the donation. Um, Ava, will you share a bit with, about what my, Mr. Rouse uh, did to just kind of help you debrief and surprise you at the end of the whole planning and all the implementation? So Mr. Rouse surprised us with um, therapy dogs, um, Duncan from Leola and Cola, which is in training, um, to be a therapy dog. So we got to just spend time with them after lunch um, and just play with them for a little bit. Um, and it was a nice surprise just after the whole grief awareness day. Yeah, Mr. Rouse had the great brainstorm with all of their processing of emotions. He thought that would be a nice way to end the week. and. David was actually on a special trip honoring his brother, so we'll have to make sure he gets to meet Duncan and Cola at some point. And David, before I ask the final question, I wanted to ask you, I know you have always have great ideas and you have been talking about what we can do next year. Can you share some of the ideas you'd like to do to expand this program for us? Um, so in the following years, I'd like to do crafts with kids to like inform them about grief. And I'd also like to start an after-school program to let kids talk to Ms. Sharp and other people and get their emotions out to let them feel whatever they want to feel. You mentioned about visiting other schools. I know that was important to Ava, too, going to middle school. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, I'd like to um, like tell this to middle school and high school to inform them about Grief Awareness Day. That way, maybe in the future, they can also do something and that we can talk to them about it also. Yeah, they've been talking a lot about wanting to make this district wide. So my final question for all of you, and I did tell you I was going to ask this, and I'll stand here so you can share, and you guys can come around. Um, just what this program did for you, what Children's Grief Awareness Day meant to you being part of the planning and just how you felt at school and things like that. So after... Children's Grief Awareness Day, I definitely felt more supported and I felt more open to talk about it because people like were telling me like, oh, I didn't know like you lost anybody or anything, but now I feel like I'm more open to talk about it because I know other people can relate. Um, it helped me by, cause I'm not good at sharing my emotions. And it helped me not be as shy, and it made me feel a lot more safer. It helped me a lot because it feels like I can actually share it to people, and I can feel like that nobody will like make fun of me or anything. Um, it impacted me because I knew that other people also lost somebody, and it made me feel not alone and that I can talk to other people about it. Thank you guys, you did an awesome job. Let's give them a hand. 
Um, I'd also like to thank um, their families who are here. They are a wonderful support through this process, just to their children and to me in supporting them, just working together to make sure they're feeling supported. And Mrs. Zawaska, one of our fifth grade teachers, is here to support the kids as well. Um, members of the board, thank you so much for listening. I hope you'll take time to look through the folder and view the video. It's, it's quite powerful. Do you have questions for these wonderful, amazing students? <laughs> I don't have a question, but I just wanted to thank you all. I wanted to come up and give you each a big hug. <laughs> um, I just think it's an awesome thing that that you've created there, and and just so helpful. And and you're all such you're all so strong, uh, and I think you can help others now from from what you experienced and from what you gained from this program. So thank you so much. I I I read the book uh, The Invisible Strings. I thought that was a wonderful book. Uh, and, and not just for young children. This whole program really should be elementary, middle, and senior high school. Um, I've seen a number of children in my family and, and friends of my children. And it doesn't just touch the children who lost someone. It touches their friends who don't know how to handle this too. And I think it's an excellent skill to learn this kind of compassion. And uh, I agree, we all just need more hugs. <laughs> I just wanted to also echo, you guys did a great job, because I know it's not easy to talk about the loss of someone. Uh, you guys can teach adults a lot of things, and for you guys to stand there and be willing to share, to, with, to be willing to share with your peers, and be willing to share with adults, it can show us as adults that it doesn't have to be um, this big undertaking, just to be open. So. Uh, you guys were an example to us as adults tonight to, to maybe step up and do better. So thank you for sharing. It's, it was really awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and I would say that there, many of their teachers made connections with them, telling them how proud they were. Um, and sadly, we had students, two students the week we were recognizing this day lose someone close to them, so it's just ongoing. Um, one thing Ava and I also spoke about the other day is Pathways Grief, Pathway Center for Grief and Loss is actually featuring these students and a program in a publication and also in a video, so we'll be sure to share that with you, Dr. Z, and the board, but I'm um, just so proud of these students and such a privilege to be able to work with them. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. All right, uh, next on our agenda, we have Carla and Katie. Do you want us here or down there? It doesn't matter, as long as you talk into the mic. <laughs> Oh my goodness, how do we follow that? <laughs> Ooh, I gotta compose myself a little bit. Um, you kids are amazing and brave to come up here. That was very touching. So I'm hoping Dr. Smith and I, as representatives for the middle school and the high school, that we can do something like that next year. So you've inspired me, so we'll work together on that. You guys, right. you, you guys are free to go. You don't have to stick around for the rest of the time if you don't want to. Bye. Sorry, I didn't mean to like kill your audience, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Carla, you're not free to go. <laughs> All right, so I'm Carla Di Clemente. I'm the school social worker for grades seven through 12 and for our families that speak Spanish. And I'm Katie Reif. I'm the school social worker for elementary K through six. And we are very grateful to be here to share what we have been up to the past year, um, and especially this year. Um, so some of the highlights for this year. You can click all five. So we'll start with communication with our parents. Um, we have utilized a remind to send out information, whether that's for um, community events that are going on, food drives, even our own lunch pickup. Um, for our Spanish-speaking families, I started sending out messages um, as well. So it was just a way, especially through COVID, to communicate with our parents because it's not always easy to have them on the phone, on a phone call. Um, so it was just we found much easier to connect with them through a text message and, and sending out information that way. So we've reached over 250 families 
um, including our Spanish-speaking families. Um, also, we have been able to provide $1,915 in gift cards this school year alone to assist our families, and that's in different ways through gas cards, um, food gift cards, um, or Target or Walmart, and those have been donated through our very, very supportive community, and we'll go into some of those providers here in a little bit. Some other highlights that we wanted to mention, um, our holiday program is normally like a really, really huge endeavor that, that we go through every single year. Um, so we obviously had to modify it from what we've done every previous year. And I will tell you that it was a gift to have COVID for a year to kind of like look at our program, see what we could do. And we were still able to serve the exact same amount of students within one, one and one single family. So last year we served 500 and 53 kids in 230 families, and this year we served 554 children in 231 families. How did it look different? In previous years, you as a donor would go out and buy gifts for kids, and then wrap them and bring them back, and we organized them, tagged them, and then distributed them. This year with COVID, we couldn't imagine having the number of people in and out of our buildings. It just, so we went to gift cards, everybody, up there got a $50 gift card and it was glorious. So we knew that we were handing them out, that they were getting something, um, and it really gave us a, a, a year to breathe around that program and around that holidays. Huh? Oh yeah, and it was a drive-through, so they didn't have to come in, we just had it all organized. They drove up, they gave us their name, we gave them their, um, their gift cards, their stocking stuffers, which were pre-stuffed, and um, and a wrapping paper, yes. Thank you, Carla. They, they each got a roll of wrapping paper, tags, and all that stuff to still make it very, very special, meaningful to them, but it took a lot off of us this year. Um, we had two new homeless support initiatives. We're gonna touch base on that in a little bit, in a few slides. And then we created a promo video, and we actually created our video back in the spring for for the middle school. They were running a fundraiser for our CV Ministerium Fund, and we created a little video that we're actually gonna share with you on the next slide um, about what we do, and it's just kind of a fun little little video. So whoever has the mouse, I have no idea who has the mouse, but you're gonna have to click it and then hit the little play button, please. <laughs> Thank you. 
On our social media, we shared it with our 250 plus people um, that we text regularly. And um, I believe it was even shared by the district. Um, just to let people know, especially during COVID, you know, if there is something you need, we're here to help. And that's what we're here for. So um, yeah, we just, sh we shared it with our Lancaster County Social Work Network as well, just to say, hey, here's an idea for you guys to just promote what you do um, in a climate where some people that might not be used to asking for help, just making it aware that we're here for help. Um, especially for those who may not have previously utilized our services. You good? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there. All right, so next we're gonna look at our referral data. Um, we were able to compare it. This year's data up, in, up to date is in the first column. The Last year's data to date is in the second column, and then the total year's data from last year is in the third column. So um, our affidavit of guardianships are pretty consistent. Um, our clothing, it it's kind of surprises us, truthfully, that our food and clothing um, referrals have been down. You would think that with COVID, that number would be higher than what it is. Um, and we think that it's probably because for the food especially, like people could bypass us because there were other resources. So it wasn't necessarily coming through us to get those referrals completed. So with CVCCS, for instance, their criteria for food bank changed, but they were publicizing that. So people could have signed up for that service and it wouldn't have necessarily gone through us. So that's one thought that we have. But again, we're kind of stumped that our numbers are that low for those. Home visits. You, as you can see, have been up um, tremendously. I mean, we had 96 attempted compared to 79, and then 355 successful home visits compared to where we were last year at this time at 133. So those numbers we definitely know are due to, um, you know, our increased number of uh, home visits we're doing for uh, COVID, quarantine supply drop-offs. We are doing hotspot drop-offs. We're doing more drop-offs where sometimes those families could have come to us, but we're instead going to them to minimize that contact um, with them coming into the building. So our numbers are definitely up. Again, there is another add to that. Last year at this time, I hadn't begun doing our kindergarten registration um, home visits. So 80 of those 355 would be um, Brownstown's home visits for kindergarten screen for kindergarten screening and registration. So I do know that our number, the last column, the 109 and the 287, would have included last year's kindergarten uh, home visits, which do add up. I mean, when you're doing home visits for four different buildings like that, 80, 60, 60 to 70 in a day, they really do add up. So that number is um, increased a little bit because I did start doing those home visits. Great, so you can see there um, medical, that's usually for our vision um, referrals. We have a partnership with Modernize, um, so we do get uh, vouchers for vision or lenses or, um, I'm sorry, frames or exams. Um, so part of that medical number is um, those vouchers that we give out, um, as well as helping families apply for like medical assistance or CHIP. Um, next, you can see the number of uh, meetings that we've had face-to-face -face with parents or students or through Zoom, we do count those. Um, another number to really point out um, how much that has grown is our Spanish number. So for me, that has almost doubled um, this time last year. A lot of that, I think, has to do with just being in the district for a couple of years now, so families kind of know, hey, you can call Carla. Um, so word of mouth, um, the text messages, and... Um, also through COVID, I think families just kind of needed to know what was going on. So they were trying to help or trying to reach out for help wherever they could just to make sure they were understanding all those changes. Um, so and a lot of that has to do with the COVID calls, um, helping our administrators and our nurses with um, contact tracing. Um, and then we have another category, which is kind of things that don't fit in there um, with the other ones, whether it be gift cards for um, other places where it's you know, maybe it's assistance for a homeless student that needs items for CTC. Um, other kind of 
custody questions that we get asked. Um, our role is a lot of, um, I'm not sure, let's just ask Katie and Carla. <laughs> so we usually get those kind of different questions, um, you know, those kinds of calls. And then of course residency, we do um, get those referrals. If we get, you know, mail that's returned with a vacant, um, you know, written on there or forwarding address or somehow or another we think that there's a residency concern where individuals are no longer living in our district and we investigate those. Um, let's see. So in total, we have worked with 420 families altogether this year. So that was the other important number there. Okay, so how has our role changed through COVID? Um, as Katie mentioned before, we're doing a lot more home visits um, just because of, like she mentioned, um, our kids are either quarantined or you know, we have students that have chosen to be RTV. Um, parents don't have transportation, so we're taking items out to the house. Um, we're supplying them with um, you know, hotspots so there aren't any barriers to the education. If they've had to quarantine, they don't have internet for whatever reason, then we're able to provide a hotspot for them that's temporary, um, as well as trying to triage and figure out long-term solutions, hopefully, with internet, um, since our, it's essential that our kids need those. So um, the IU13 has partnered with Comcast, with Blue Ridge, and so they were able to provide um, funding for families that have, um, or that apply for Comcast, they have a promo that is two free months and then four free months with that promo code that we can provide for families. So essentially they're getting six free months of internet um, if they do qualify for that. So we are able to link families to that. Um, evictions, we haven't seen as many evictions due to um, non-pavement, of course, because of the moratorium that's in place right now. So we'll just kind of waiting and seeing, you know, when that's going to change and how that's going to then affect our role in helping um, our families. And like I mentioned before, obviously with the Spanish um, piece, that has definitely gone up with um, assisting with contact tracing. Um, I've been working closely with the CVVA program in the elementary level, um, just trying to help get connected to families who aren't responding, who aren't doing the work, um, navigating technological issues, um, completing some SAPES um, for attendance and then helping struggling families, trying to help them see that maybe CBVA wasn't the best fit for them and helping them see if returning to brick and mortar was an option for them. So what are our homeless numbers? Um, so right now, as of today, we have um, 89. 89 children have experienced homelessness this school year. 25 at the high school, 7 at Leola, 16 at Smoketown, 11 at the middle school, 15 at Fritz, 6 at Brownstown, and then we have 9 siblings that are not school age. Our numbers are really low um, compared to where we were last year and even the year before. You can see last year we ended uh, lower than the prior year, so we were 11 short than the 2018-2019 school year. Um, we really do attribute this to COVID, the moratorium. Other school districts are seeing the exact same. School District of Lancaster is way low. Um, it's either that they're not being evicted yet or we just can't figure out that they're homeless because they're either virtual or they um, aren't bus riders anymore because of COVID and they're becoming car riders. Yeah, they weren't bus riders, so now they're car riders and it's harder to track who is a car rider living outside of our district than compared to the ones who are, are in, in district. So we're just kind of rolling with it. We wish that we would have the data from the state. They haven't published the data that we submit to them for the last two school years. So when we ended 2017, 2018, we were, we were second in the county, but we haven't been able to compare ourselves to the rest of the county for the last two school years. We keep asking our regional off, office why and they keep saying we don't know we really would love the data too so I don't know if they'll just issue and publicize all three years at one time when they get around to it but we we imagine that we're still in that upper um, one of the higher school districts compared to the rest of the county but everybody is seeing their numbers drop
so you may be wondering why are some of our students experiencing homelessness? And so we have a breakdown there, um, either because of death of a parent, domestic violence, um, evictions, and that would be due to other reasons than um, fire, incarceration of a parent, um, job lost. Um, left home is usually our unaccompanied youth. That's usually our high school students that decide to leave um, or they get kicked out. Um, natural disasters, that would be, you know, like some of our students are coming over from Puerto Rico if there's been hurricanes or earthquakes. Um, other is usually other poverty-related situations. Um, you know, some of them can be a little bit more um, complicated than others, so they fit into that category. And then, of course, the separation or divorce of a parent. So a grant opportunity arose last year. Um, we actually started working on it with the School District of Lancaster and Community Services Group. Um, we applied for a grant through Lanco My Home, which is formerly the Lancaster County Coalition to End Homelessness. Lanco My Home is much easier to say. Um, but we had applied back right before COVID, and then it kind of sat. Um, and then in November, we actually got word that they were hiring this position. <laughs> and um, Cecile Crowley joined us in December by the time we could finally, no, she started in November, but it wasn't until the beginning of um, February until she actually started with us. So she's only been with us a short time, um, but Carla and I are sending her some of our, our long-term homeless families who just haven't been able to figure out the housing and she's providing intensive case management for them. So she spends about one day a week working with our families and the, the other four days out of the week are with School District of Lancaster. She is housed in School District of Lancaster. She is, um, there is no financial contribution from CV or School District of Lancaster. All the funding for her position is through Man Lanco My Home and goes directly to CSG to fund her position. Um, we did put in our, our name for next year. They are looking to add an extra 0.5 position to what Lanco My Home is funding. Um, and Donical will also be joining us next year under this grant. So we won't know if we get it. We're still trying to navigate what it looks like with Cecile because a lot of what she would do is already overlapping with what we're doing. So we're trying to take a step back with some of our families and say, okay, this might be a Cecile where she can check in regularly, weekly, where Carla and I aren't necessarily able to check in weekly with families. So truly identifying the families who need that really intensive um, check-in routine with a case or a social worker. Um, so yeah. Right, so I talked about earlier some of the partnerships that we have with our communities, um, especially our churches. So one partnership was with Forest Hills Mennonite Church. Um, they asked us how they can support our families. Um, and so we came up with this idea of trying to just have gift cards readily available so we can support them that way. If it's through gas, groceries, Walmart or Target gift cards um, would go directly to those families that are identified as homeless. And it's important to note that a little visual you see is actually what they, it says, here's a little something to remind you that we care from your friends at Forest Hills Mennonite Church. So I can't read the small print, but something along those lines. And we do give them out to each family as they're identified. So this is not a, hey, I need a gas card. This is, hey, I'm sorry you're in this position. Here's a, ga a, a gift card. Um, the other program that we kind of, uh, that we implemented this year was around the holidays. Um, Lancaster County Family Chiropractic, they've always been a wonderful supporter of our program at the holidays. Um, knowing that their clientele really like buying gifts compared to a gift card, we, we kind of, um, we partnered up with Bentley Ridge who also came to us saying, hey, we'd really like to do a project. And so what we did was we had Lancaster Family Chiropractic clients buy um, snacks gift um, snacks, blankets, and um, games. And they brought all that in for 22 families, 22 or 23 families. And then Bentley Ridge provided the baskets, toiletries, and school supplies. 
So all of our families that um, were experiencing homelessness at that point um, all got a basket, and they were really appreciative of it. It just gave them a little something extra to, to celebrate the holidays with. So That concludes our um, presentation. Do you have any questions for us? Any questions, board? Thanks for everything that you do. I know it's not easy. I'm certain it's not easy, but thank you. Well, we appreciate the opportunity to work together and for you all. Absolutely. All right, this is our first time in our meeting for public comments. I don't see anything from the, anyone from the public here uh, as they all left. Um, so any comments from CVEA? I don't see anyone from CVEA here either. Uh, comments from any other employee groups? So with that board you have in front of you, our consent agenda, obviously things we've talked about are, are uh, that are routine in nature. I need a motion to approve our consent agenda tonight. So moved. Second. Uh, roll call, starting with Dana. Aye. 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 And aye. <clears throat> Odd uh, occurrence here, we have no action discussion items tonight, so with that board you have in front of you your finance and operation report and the curriculum and instruction report. Any questions on those for the administration? Um, IDET, any highlights that's not listed in your report that you want to bring out with your reports? Just one, uh, PSBA had sort of removed and they brought back in their um, spring legal roundup for board members. Um, it's an excellent way to stay up to date on the little changes that uh, we're often not aware of. They cover not just the legislative changes, but the uh, court rulings that affect a lot of the decisions that get made in the school. Excellent program. Awesome, thank you. Diane, big report from the CTC since you're now the <laughs> the meeting is next week, <laughs> so maybe next month. I'm kidding. Uh, Fred, do you have anything to share with us? So, um, we have Would you uh, speak into the mic, please? Thank you. I don't think it's turned on. Mm -mm. Or just speak louder into it, Fred. I think I know where the switch is. Somebody muted it. Oh, got it. Okay, so the middle school is uh, presently at 23% complete. Um, but basically, what's going on now is on, in the site work, uh, there's still more stormwater uh, inlets and piping being installed. Uh, as you can see, when you came into this building or into the parking lot, the east side of this building, a retaining wall is part of this project. That's being built. Um, some, uh, some flat areas for, for parking, parking lots are being stoned in. Uh, as far as the building, uh, and there's also, I'm sorry, there's also a, a, a very long electrical duct bank that's working its way over to the, uh, to the new building. Uh, there was a picture of the retaining wall starting uh, that's, that's beside this building. Um, as far as the, the building construction itself, uh, area B uh, is at um, uh, a level where the uh, structural steel has been erected. The masonry retaining walls are being, uh, I'm going to say they're probably about 95% complete and uh, presently preparing to install the concrete plank flooring for the next level. Uh, the other areas, um, B, C, and D, uh, foundations, footers and foundations are being installed. This picture here, uh, I'll just comment on quickly, is, is the transition between A uh, and stepping up in grade. So there's a retaining wall there. I'm coming up to the next level uh, to area B. Uh, but again, footers and foundations are being installed there. Underground uh, um, utilities are starting out. Um, as I said, the concrete plank, that, that picture there is the uh, area D foundations, uh, footings and foundations going in. Um, so that's, that's pretty much the, uh, the middle school at this stage. Um, I'll comment quickly on uh, Brownstown. Uh, we are uh, 
um, trying to knock out uh, the remaining deficiency items. Uh, basically, there's three prime contractors, the electrical, the HVAC, and the uh, general uh, have a, a handful of items uh, that uh, they were either they're waiting for parts for or, uh, or they're just lagging their feet and not, or dragging their feet and not getting them done. Uh, but it has, has whittled down to a handful of items. There's a few uh, warranty items that, that have popped up, uh, some exterior concrete uh, presenting some cracks and, and those types of things uh, that, that we're addressing. Questions? Questions, board? All right. Thank you, Fred. Yep. <clears throat> this is the second time in our meeting for public comments. Seeing none. Uh, any board announcements or initiatives tonight? All right, board, you'll see the dates for uh, next month in your agenda there. And with that, board, I will take a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned.